Okay, unmute your microphone if you really need it. <coughs> okay. Hi everyone, I will begin the next talk about Brackle things of the day. Please uh, turn off your cell phones and enjoy. Hey everyone, so uh, I'm Tarek and I'm here to talk about Vaurien. So I'm, I'm going to try, so who's Italian here? Please raise your hand. Oh, okay. Uh, so I need your help. I didn't know how to translate Vaurien in uh, Italian. Uh, so um, Vaurien is those little kids that are always annoying and that are doing some tricks to you. For example, they put some potato in your uh, exhaust pipe in your car or they try to break your tire of your bike. So how, how you, would you say that word in, in uh, Italian? Monello, okay. So the name of my software is Monello and the goal of it is to create chaos in your TCP stack just to make sure that everything works fine. And um, so that's the logo. Uh, I'm completely unallowed to use this logo but it's okay. It's a small software. Uh, so, so do you know Family Guy? The, okay, so that's from the Family Guy. That's the monkey in the closet. Uh, from time to time, uh, he goes out of the closet and do like this. Eah! So I really like this logo, so we used it. All right, so uh, when you're building a web application, the theory says that you create your web application and then you deploy it to a dev server. And once you're happy with your development, you push it to a stage server. You have a whole team working on load testing it, doing all the QA work. And when you're happy with it, you just push it on production and everything goes smooth. You're really happy. You just drink a macchiato and everything's fine. And then when you have a new version, you do it this again. But this is in theory. So but in, in, in reality, what happens usually is that something will, will always break in production. You will always have some issues somewhere in your stack, whether it's a disk that's full or uh, some application that doesn't work like you, it's supposed to work. And I have never, never, ever pushed something in production that worked exactly like uh, what it was supposed to work. So how many people here never had any issue in production? All right, so you know what I'm talking about. You have something that works smoothly on stage and when you push it in production, everything breaks, you start to sweat, and you try to find the, the, the issue. Uh, so I have one real life example. So, so uh, we had when we deployed Firefox Sync. So Firefox Sync, when I joined Mozilla, was written in PHP. It was a PHP application on the top of a MySQL database and also an LDAP uh, uh, server. And I was uh, in charge of uh, rewriting the whole application using Python, which I did. And I was bragging about Python, say, hey, PHP suck, we're going to use Python, it's going to be much faster. And they, they trusted me. They, they, they were like, yeah, okay, go ahead, do it. So I pushed everything in stage, we did some load testing, everything worked perfectly. And the day we pushed uh, in production and had a little bit more load, everything started to crash. And everything started to crash just because of this call over there, socket sand. So uh, do you know how to do socket programming? Uh, raise your hand if you know this API. So this API, you should never use it because when you call socket send and you send some data, if you're uh, having a, a, an application that's uh, loaded with a, a lot of people on it, uh, basically this API will send you back some data, some uh, a number. And this number is the number of bytes it was enabled to push through the pipe. In other words, the more people you have, the, the more uh, likely it is that some data won't go through it. And you have to check the number that comes back from this, this API and loop until everything is sent through. And we used, um, we used a driver to ac access our MySQL database that didn't do the proper thing uh, when using this API. And we got caught by this issue. So everything broke. Uh, we rolled back to PHP. I was uh, really, really uh, feeling bad about it. At, and after a while, we fixed it and 
eventually everything worked uh, fine. So if you do some socket programming, that's the right pattern to use. You have to loop until everything is sent, or you just use send all, and send all will take care of it for you. And that only happens, uh, this issue only happens when you're on high load, uh, and it only happens when you're using a SQL server that's not on your local host. In other words, uh, it was uh, something uh, that happen only in production. So that sucks. And you have a lot of uh, other failures that can happen when you do some web uh, application. The famous lost connection to MySQL server, that's probably one of the most uh, uh, search uh, thing on Google. People just co copy and paste it. So that's basically uh, when you set up by default a MySQL server, every 24 hours, I think, it goes down if your connection is not doing anything. And so uh, on the next uh, call, if you don't do the proper thing on the Python side, it's going to break. How many people did have this one before? OK. Uh, timeout errors, uh, too many connections, too many open files. For example, if you have uh, on your database server, if you don't set properly the file descriptor limits, you're going to hit that on Nginx or MySQL or whatever. It's, uh, it's something we've always had uh, in our production servers until it's tweaked, etc., uh, etc. Et so basically, there are a lot of failures that will, you will encounter uh, once you try to push your uh, code in production. And uh, most of the time, people don't retest really this part of, uh, of the process. They do unit tests, they do functional tests, they push stuff, they do some, some, some manual tests on their application, but all the I.O. issues they can have uh, in production is usually uh, something that's tested by the end user and uh, fixed after uh, a while uh, in production. So that's re that really sucks. So once we had this bug uh, on, on our deployment, we started to wonder how we could improve things, how we could uh, be proactive uh, to avoid all those uh, bugs. And uh, what we usually did before uh, we started to, to, uh, to create Vorian was to do manual testing. And well, it's, it's, it works pretty well, you can like, uh, restart MySQL or Postgres and shut it down or do all kinds of uh, tricks like this just to make sure that your web application behaves correctly. You can have like a checklist of stuff to, to, to check. Uh, if I restart MySQL, uh, does my uh, web application uh, connectors are behaving correctly or do I have some exhausted connectors in my pool that are locked forever? Um, if, I, if, I, uh, if I shut down my LDAP server, do I have uh, ugly 500s on my uh, web application or do I have uh, a nice little uh, web page for people to say that something is wrong, etc., cetera, et cetera. But the, the issue with this is that uh, the list can be pretty long if you have a, 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 a big infrastructure, uh, the checklist, and it's very tedious. Um, if you uh, are trying to push new version in production uh, often if you try to be agile, uh, doing manual testing is really tedious. So, Vorian is the solution to this problem. It's a TCP failure simulation framework. In other words, if you use Vorian, you can proactively uh, check that your web application behaves correctly when something is screwed up in your TCP stack. Let's look at the design. So basically, Vorian is a proxy between your web application and any backend you have. For example, if you have a MySQL backend, uh, you can put a Vorian uh, proxy between your application and the MySQL uh, uh, database. And Vorian is designed into uh, two parts. The first part is the protocol, and the second part is the behavior. Uh, when you are configuring a Vorian between an application and a backend, you say, hey, 
This backend in MySQL is MySQL, so I'm going to pick the, pro the MySQL protocol. And uh, I want to do uh, uh, some hang. I, wanna, I want to have uh, everything that goes through the proxy hangs. Uh, so I'm going to use the hang behavior. So Vorian is organized around a collection of protocols and a collection of behaviors. You pick pro a protocol, you pick a behavior, and you create a chaos between your web application and your backend. Let's look in, in, in more details. For example, in this example, uh, I have a MySQL database, and I want to add some delay every time uh, the MySQL server is called. I want to, to make sure that all the SQL queries that are, my application are making, is making on uh, the MySQL server uh, are delayed for five seconds. So when I start to do some load on my application, if there is anything wrong with my pool of connectors, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start to crash uh, when you do that. And it's a good way to make sure it's robust. So basically, what I will do is change the application configuration so it doesn't go directly to MySQL, but instead of the, using the port uh, 3306, it will use the port 30, 3307. And there, I will run a Vorian that listen to this port and just pass all the queries to the MySQL backend. But when it does this, it also um, uses the delete uh, behavior. And the delete behavior is just a plugin that will do something before and after uh, the query, the request is sent to the MySQL backend. And we did, uh, we, we organized the, the tool like this because it allows anyone to create any kind of behavior or protocol uh, plugin. So uh, when you install Vorian, you, you have uh, a bunch of uh, protocols for free. You have the uh, HTTP protocol uh, that uh, knows how to uh, read uh, HTTP requests and send them back. Uh, it supports uh, uh, most of the HTTP protocol uh, behavior. For example, it supports the, the stay live and stuff like this. Uh, it has the, uh, we also provide a memcache protocol uh, plugin, a MySQL, a Redis, a SMTP, and a generic uh, TCP plugin. So basically, if you have a, an exotic uh, TCP server with uh, its own protocol, uh, uh, you can use the TCP protocol and it will probably work. And if it doesn't work, you can inherit from uh, this protocol and create your own. Uh, so I had to do this, for example, for Redis because Redis has a specific way of uh, dealing with uh, packets. So I just, wrote, uh, I just looked at uh, the um, uh, specification and wrote a plugin that works with uh, the Redis. For MySQL, uh, unlike many protocol, uh, in MySQL, when you connect to a server, the server sends you the first packet and tells you, hey, I'm MySQL. If you want to connect, you have to do this and that, unlike uh, other protocols where it's the other way around. So uh, that's why there is a specific MySQL uh, protocol. And in terms of behavior, we have uh, a few behavior we will provide. The blackout behavior is a nightmare for many web applications. Basically, uh, the blackout behavior just stays there and does nothing. The socket, uh, it opens the socket and, and does nothing with it. So basically what happens when you use the blackout behavior is uh, that uh, your application starts to have weird errors. There is also the hang behavior. Uh, it blocks the socket, so your, uh, your application most of the time just explodes. Uh, there is the delay behavior, which is uh, uh, one of the most simple. And the error behavior. So the error behavior uh, is aware of a few protocols. If you use the HTTP protocol uh, with the error behavior, it will be able to send 500s or HTTP specific errors. Or uh, if you want to do a very specific LDAP, uh, simulate a very specific LDAP error, you can use the error uh, behavior and just copy and paste the LDAP error and push it in the socket. Uh, so anyways, so that's only built-in protocols and behavior and most of the time uh, things get uh, interesting when you create your own protocols and behavior. 
When you, when you try, for example, to reproduce an issue you had in production and you want to make sure that uh, the next release will support uh, and not crash like it did before. Um, so how do you use Vorian? Vorian can be used from the command line. If you do a pip install Vorian, it's going to install it. Um, it doesn't have a lot of dependency, it's straightforward. And then you can use it from the command line. Here, what I call uh, Vorian proxy with the backend here, I define, uh, I say that I want to use the SMTP protocol and there is a behavior option where I say that I want to have 5% of errors and 10% of delays. So with this line, any web application that will try to send emails uh, through the Vorian proxy uh, will end up having a rate of 5% of errors and 10% of delays. With this uh, uh, call, uh, you will uh, definitely find issues in your application if they try to send email. And you will start to add some try accept, SMTP error, et cetera, et cetera. And after a while, your, uh, SM, your, the piece of code you have in your application that sends email will be more robust because you will uh, end up uh, finding all the issues you can find with a SMTP server that uh, screws up. Uh, here, uh, this one, 5% of the calls just hang. And uh, after a while, if you don't do the proper things uh, in your uh, pool of connectors, in SQL Alchemy or whatever, if you don't recycle your connectors, etc., it's gonna it's gonna break. So I like this one because uh, uh, since it's only five percent of the time, uh, I can just put it in on stage, let it there, and the day after, just come back and see how many stack trace I have, and fix fix the things. Uh, you can do that uh, even with non-Python application, uh, web application, of course. Uh, I mean, if you are a DevOps or a QA guy, uh, this kind of tool is pretty cool. You can even not tell it to the developers. You can tell them that their applications suck because you had a lot of trace back. So it's your little secret. Uh, so um, after a while, so, so here you see the command line can be really long, so you can also use a config file. So a config file is just uh, the same thing, but using a INI file. So you can call Vorian and the config and define there uh, the kind of um, uh, configuration you want. So here it's a HTTP proxy, uh, the backend is Google, and the, the front end is on local OS 8000. And every time I, 20% uh, of the time, I will have a two second delay on, uh, uh, on the call. So uh, this is for the command line. And this is very suitable if you're a DevOps or a QA guy and you, you don't care about doing some Python coding, so you can just put your uh, voyance uh, all over the place on stage or on your dev server and see how things are going. But if you're a Python developer, what's interesting is to be able to integrate voyance tests into your uh, regression tests. So every time you, you, you find something that's bad with your application, you can write a test and make sure that uh, it's going to be uh, unit tested every time uh, you change your code. So we provide in Vorian a few APIs you can use to do this. In this example, I have a unit test and on the setup here, start proxy will uh, start a Vorian proxy. Uh, the teardown will just stop it. And in my test, I have a context manager here and I can say with a client, with a behavior error, please do something there. So here I can try some, uh, uh, some of my application uh, while the proxy is erroring out. So for example, if I have a piece of code that do some LDAP queries, I can make sure that when LDAP errors out, uh, my, my code is doing the proper thing, the proper behavior. Uh, for example, uh, some kind of error or some kind of tr uh, trying again a few times, etc., etc. So 
and, and then we're back to normal here. So, in other words, Vorian provides the APIs and provides a way to control it from the code. It has a little socket, it opens a little socket and you can interact with a proxy that's running on your, uh, somewhere. You can tell it to change its behavior, you can tell it to change uh, uh, how it works uh, from the code. Uh, it's just REST, uh, it's a REST API to, to, uh, to drive it. So, uh, I said earlier that you could uh, extend, uh, extend Vorian uh, to do uh, your own uh, behaviors and protocol. And this is an example of uh, a protocol you can create. Basically, uh, all you have to do is to inherit from the dummy behavior class. And then you can give to, uh, a name to your uh, behavior. A few options here, like this one has a, a, a sleep option. And you have to implement two methods. The first method is on before handle. It's basically uh, a call that will be made just before uh, the backend is called. And it gets uh, the protocol instance, uh, the source, the destination socket, and to backend is uh, a, bull, a flag that says that. Uh, that tells you if you go from the front end to the back end or on the other side. And on after handle is right after the call. So with those two methods you can implement any kind of behavior and you can interfere with anything that's happening. Here it's a simple time slip. But you could also read the data that's in the, the source socket. It's a, it's, a, it's a simple socket. You can do a source.read or whatever you want. You can also uh, interact with the data that's coming back and do whatever you want. And the protocol uh, um, attribute is the instance of the protocol plugin that's being running. So basically, uh, it's useful to have it in the behavior because you can have a behavior that uh, behaves differently depending on the protocol. For example, the error protocol is not behaving the same way if it's uh, the HTTP protocol uh, or if it's uh, another protocol. When it detects that the protocol is HTTP, it will do specifically HTTP errors, uh, etc. So writing a protocol is uh, also uh, uh, writing a uh, class. So you can inherit from uh, uh, the best protocol class or from any protocol that's already implemented. Here there is a typo, uh, should have been uh, the base protocol instead of TCP. But basically the idea is that you inherit from a base class and then you have one uh, method to implement which is handle. And handle takes the source socket, the destination socket, the direction. Is, is it coming from, from the front end to the back end or the other side? And then you can do whatever you want. So for example the HTTP protocol reach the source, reach the header of the HTTP request and do the right things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very simple to implement a new protocol. So uh, at uh, Mozilla we used, uh, so I use, for, I, I use Vorian for when I do my developments uh, just out of curiosity uh, when I want to see if my stuff is robust. Most of, most of the time it's not. Uh, so uh, I break things, try to fix them, etc. And we use also, um, we use Vorian for Firefox Marketplace, which is our app store in the Firefox OS phone. If you're, uh, you should uh, definitely get a Firefox OS phone, they're super cool. Uh, and we found a lot of bugs. So we added uh, proxies between the Django application and all the backends. Uh, uh, the Firefox Marketplace has around 10 different backends. So we have 10 uh, Vorian proxies be behind uh, the Django application and we started to break things. And I think we filled uh, maybe uh, 20 or 30 bugs about the uh, issue we found. And after a little bit of time we, we were able to fix a lot of behaviors, misbehaviors in uh, our Marketplace application all those misbehaviors were the one we would have hit 
in production if we wouldn't have do that. Uh, I'm not saying that 100% of the issue were fixed, of course not, but what I'm saying is that when you use uh, proxies, uh, like uh, when you use Vorian to try out your application, you will fix a lot of uh, issues with, with your code. So if you look at this URL, you will find a blog post where we explained everything we've done and all the issues we found. Uh, uh, I have time, huh? plenty of time. So I can like do a transition like this until it's time. <laughs> Well, thank you. That's all I have. Uh, so Vorian is uh, Apache. It's under the Apache license uh, version two. It's uh, this is the documentation. Uh, everything is open source. You can find the code on GitHub there. And you're welcome to help us improving this tool. Or if you have uh, really cool plugins or behavior, we're interested in uh, adding them in the tool. Uh, that's it. So, any questions? Hello. Yeah. Yep. Hi, thanks a lot uh, for the talk. Uh, I have a simple question first. Uh, do you use it on production? No. <laughs> uh, we use it on stage. So the, the, the thing is, uh, we have a dummy. Uh, so the idea I had when I created the tool was to put Voria in production with a transparent proxy, uh, transparent behavior, a dummy behavior. Uh, and, and then uh, sometimes m turn it to do some crazy stuff. But uh, the problem is that it adds overhead mm. because you're doing uh, extra hops. And uh, I'm not confident enough to do this. Uh, if it breaks, it's, it's going to be bad. Mm. So we only push it on stage uh, or dev boxes. OK. And another question is, uh, when you simulate an error on the backend side, I tend to believe that the, that is a responsibility of the backend uh, to fix the error. So, uh, what, what what kind of error you fix? Uh, so, uh, I have numerous examples. Uh, at some point, I mean, when you build a web application uh, uh, and you have to work with the backend, uh, you have to cope with errors that ha are happening on the back end, even if it's something that you need to fix on the back end. The question is not about uh, 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 f um, the error itself, but about how your web application behaves when an er error is happening, and if your web application goes back on its feet uh, after the error. I, I have a simple example. You have an LDAP server. The disk is full. LDAP starts to screw. Uh, and everything starts to, to, to break. You have to fix LDAP. You have to clean the disk eventually. But what happens in the meantime? Do you have ugly 500 errors on your, LDAP, on your web application? Or do you have a nice screen that says, hey, we have a small issue, come back later, etc." So it's really about how your application behaves in a hostile environment. Tarek, hello. Ouais. Thanks, thanks a lot for thanks. the uh, excellent talk. Uh, two questions. First, how do you manage when you want to have uh, Vorian and not Vorian? Uh, what I mean is you have, uh, for example, your MySQL server on port 3306. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to test sometimes on the 3307, yeah. or yeah. how do you? So uh, when uh, it's Django, you can, uh, Django has the setting, settings file. So I have a set of uh, I have a section that contains all my Vorian configuration for the ports, and I have uh, the normal one, and I use environment variables, for example, to uh, to say hey I want to run Django uh, using Vorian or not stuff like this, and I guess you can do the same thing for uh, Pyramid or whatever. Uh, it's basically making sure that you are able in your uh, web application to tweak, to change uh, the, the back-end uh, configuration. Okay, 
Makes sense. Okay. Uh, second question. Uh, when you talked about your use case, putting it on staging and just waiting forever or for a few days yeah, and seeing, yeah. uh, do you have some kind of logging with the timestamp so you can go afterwards and check on the... So we have, we added in Vorian a uh, stat D stuff to just uh, log some stuff, but that's it, nothing fancy. But um, you can chain uh, behaviors, uh, so you can probably do fancier stuff there and log some stuff. And so our goal was with the set D was to be sure that the crash was because of Voyant, not something else. So uh, we did some stat D uh, pings to make sure that it was the same timings than the crash. Other questions? First of all, thank you for Thanks. building this and for talking about it. This is great. I really, really Thanks. wanted this. Um, now, is there going to be any problem for me using that with Postgres? No. Probably just going to do no, the generic uh, TCP, right? Yeah, it's TCP. So what I do when I build the new protocol uh, stuff, I use the TCP, generic TCP protocol. Uh, the TCP one just sucks data from that comes in and push it uh, in the back. And if it doesn't work, just read uh, the Postgres uh, specs or just add uh, some kind of uh, uh, stuff to, to, to see what the packets that are going through. Or just use a, a Postgres uh, Python driver, just see how it works. Uh, that's what uh, you can do. And uh, most of the time it's really simple to, to do a minimalistic uh, uh, plugin for a given uh, protocol. Uh, for example, uh, here, uh, for, uh, for Redis, um, so Redis is based on uh, HTTP, but you have some specific stuff. Uh, so I, I, I looked at this uh, page that explains the protocol, and I just did a by iteration until my proxy worked on Redis. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> so, see? Sometimes it's not finished, but... Th this, uh, this plugin was uh, enough for us to... Uh, it supports most Redis calls, mm -hmm. and it was enough to, to play with uh, Voria. Uh, so you can probably do something similar with uh, Postgres. Uh, for MySQL, let's see. Huh. So for MySQL, it's just uh, the TCP protocol. Uh, I removed the keep alive option, and that's it. So the generic TCP protocol works with MySQL. So if you, you if you try it, it, sh it should uh, it should it might work with Postgres as well. And the CD TCP protocol is super simple. It just grab the data and send it to the back end. That's it. it it's fun to write uh, plugins because you eventually uh, understand how things work in uh, protocols. Uh. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, mm, one of the most um, common error I have with uh, Django is a uh, read data error. It's when some some people uh, send a file to the application yeah. and press the undo button or stop button. Yeah. And do you have a behavior to to mock this or to? So so what happens exactly? What kind of backend uh, are you calling with Django? It's a HTTP. So it's a HTTP no, server. Actually, Django is not calling a, a backend. But is it possible to 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 have a Vorian between the, the browser and the Django application? Oh. Uh, as a web server? Uh, as a proxy, yes, to, to mock uh, this error? I never tried, but uh, if you use the uh, HTTP uh, protocol uh, and run it, you can do it, yeah? And you can probably write a behavior that does what you've described. Yeah. Okay. But the question is, you won't be able uh, to integrate it in your tests, I guess, uh, unless you have functional tests that mimics the browser. 
because Voyan was written to, to, tr to test uh, backends between your web application and uh, some backends. In your case, it's between the client and the web server, so I've never done this, but why not? Okay, thanks. That's it. All right, grazie mille. And bon appétit.